There has been no silver rally either. I've put these convenient little labels here of what a silver rally looks like in real terms. Um, and this has a lot to do with gold and silver miners, and I'll get to that in a second. So from April to uh, April, April 2019 to April 2020, that was a huge silver rally in real terms, meaning silver was outperforming other commodities uh, because people were worried about monetary disasters. And we had here uh, a major high in July of 2020 with silver really outperforming other commodities. Um, and then from then, from about July 2020 until uh, July 2022, for two years, we had a major silver decline from 0.2 to uh, about 0.06. That's a huge silver decline. And from there, for, since 2023, we've been pretty stable. It has not moved. In the ever-fluctuating world of commodities trading, it's crucial to stay informed and vigilant. Today, we delve into the insights provided by renowned analyst Rafi Farber. His recent video sheds light on key indicators in the silver market and unveils the intricate dynamics at play in the broader commodities landscape. Join us as we dissect his expert analysis and glean actionable insights for navigating the tumultuous waters of silver futures. Faber kicks off with a detailed examination of the cautionary signals emanating from the silver futures market. Open interest, a metric reflecting the number of futures contracts in play, has surged to a three-year high, reminiscent of levels last seen in mid-2021. With silver hovering around the $1.30 mark, Faber emphasizes the critical juncture we find ourselves in. The trajectory of open interest, whether it escalates or recedes, holds the key to discerning potential market movements. Should open interest decline amidst a price surge, a short squeeze scenario could unfold, albeit with no guarantees. Faber underscores the importance of cautious positioning advocating against leveraged silver vehicles in the current climate. Transitioning seamlessly, Faber delves into the intriguing interplay between gold, real yields, and Federal Reserve policies, drawing on a chart depicting Federal Reserve losses juxtaposed with real interest rates. He elucidates a compelling narrative. Despite nominal real interest rates turning positive, driven by Fed-induced losses, gold and silver continue their ascent. This paradoxical divergence underscores the underlying fragility of the monetary system and portends ominous implications for the future. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more expert insights and analysis. All right, the first chart we have today is a chart of caution. Open interest in silver futures is up to a, looks like a three-year high. We haven't been this high in open interest. The amount of futures contracts open on the COMEX since mid-2021 with silver around $30. That is going to have to clear. I can't predict whether it will clear with the price going up or the price going down. If it clears and open interest falls and the price rises, that means we're in a little bit of a short squeeze. I can't guarantee that, so we got to be careful here. We're at um, this line here, I think it's 170,000 or 171,000. It says 166,000 in 23, but there's a one day lag here. So we've, uh, we've broken through this line over here, this bottom black line and the top, uh, back in 2021 was still quite a ways where we are now It's about 200,000 contracts. So there is room to move up here, but you got to be careful here and, uh, be careful of a sudden sell off. So I would just say stay out of leverage right now in leveraged silver vehicles. Um, I don't think that will be good for your emotional balance, but technically speaking, there is some room to run here if we're going to go to those old highs in open interest around 200,000 contracts, which is pretty slim, but it's possible. And I wanted to address the question that was raised by Zero Hedge in an article on April 4th. I've screenshotted the homepage uh, uh, capture of it here. It says, gold's defiance of real yields can't last unless trouble brewing. Gold's surge to record highs is extraordinary, coming as it does in the face of elevated real yields that would normally bring it crashing down. Uh, and so I put another chart here of the Federal Reserve losses, net losses versus the real interest rate. And you'll see what I'm getting at in a second. So this blue line is the Federal Reserve losses. You see here, this is actually the zero line if you look at the right axis here. So this is where zero Federal Reserve losses and they were remitting all of their extra income to the Treasury as they had done since 2008. And here we start the Federal Reserve losses. Losses means they're printing dollars that are completely unbacked, not even by debt. And as these losses accelerate, it means they're paying out interest uh, of totally unbacked dollars. And this is precisely when interest rates, real interest rates headed 
positive in real terms. So yes, interest rates are positive in real terms, meaning the yield in the 10 year is slightly higher than the inflation rate as they calculated, but that might be BS depending on what you actually buy. So this is really an artificial calculation, but let's just give it to them. So real interest rates are now positive, uh, whatever that means precisely, but why are they positive? Because it's the Fed that's paying that interest and losing money. So the dollars that are being created to pay that interest are not backed by anything and therefore, gold and silver are still climbing this is going to get worse because federal reserve losses are going to keep getting worse as they need to keep interest rates high until of course the next financial crisis which is coming very soon to a theater near you and we are the theater let's get into why exactly there really has been no gold rally even though it feels like there is and i don't mean to be negative i mean to be positive by saying that because i mean to say that the gold and silver rally are still ahead of us and this is really nothing what this is is a commodity rally and here's the proof this is the gold to the crb ratio the crb is one of the oldest commodity indexes we've had it since i don't know the 50s 60s 70 is one of those things so we see here that we are at a major pivot point in the gold to crb index and we've only really climbed significantly above this ratio one time in the 2020 crisis uh, which is when gold was at its all-time high in real terms relative to other commodities so we were at this level actually at the peak of the 2016 rally not even at the peak of the 26 rally the beginning of the 2016 rally when gold blasted out of its four-year bear market here in nominal terms at least in dollar terms and we were at this same level in early 2020 before the lockdowns and we were also at it here at the end of 2023 and we've been at this levels for all of 2024 basically and we haven't broken above it yet so what this is is really a commodity rally and i'll show you more evidence of that in a second there has been no silver rally either i've put these convenient little labels here of what a silver rally looks like in real terms um, and this has a lot to do with gold and silver miners, and I'll get to that in a second. So from April to uh, April, April 2019 to April 2020, that was a huge silver rally in real terms, meaning silver was outperforming other commodities uh, because people were worried about monetary disasters. And we had here uh, a major high in July of 2020 with silver really outperforming other commodities. Um, and then from then, from about July 2020 until uh, July 2022, for two years, we had a major silver decline from 0.2 to uh, about 0.06. That's a huge silver decline. And from there, for, since 2023, we've been pretty stable. It has not moved. Uh, we have not been in a silver rally at all. Uh, for 2024, we've had a little bit of a bump here in this little pathetic candle. We have a long way to go. What we are in right now is a commodity rally. This is the CRB index. This was a major low in the CRB index in April 2020 uh, during the lockdowns at 100. And we reached a high of 325 or 330 or whatever that is up there in 2022. And since then, uh, the CRB has pretty much been going sideways until recently we made a new high at about 295, very close to 300. So we've been in a minor commodity rally, which includes gold and silver now this is why mining stocks are not rallying so much people have been asking me why aren't the mining stocks really participating in this rally and some of them are and they have risen but not really significantly if you look over a five-year period it's not really that impressive but it's going to become impressive when this ratio changes uh when it actually goes up so if we're going back here the reason that mining stocks have not rallied so much is that if all commodities are rallying then minor profits don't rise much or at all if mining companies have to pay more to mine the silver or the gold out of the ground then their profit margins won't go that much higher and the stocks won't perform that well when gold and silver rally relative to other commodities that's when mining stocks really outperform meaning when people go after gold and silver but not other commodities because they're worried about the money that's when the metals really start to move and commodities uh don't go up as much or maybe they even go down relative to gold and silver uh and that's when the profit margins really start to move and gold mining stocks really outperform well faba proceeds to dissect the prevailing commodity rally offering a nuanced perspective on the trajectory of gold and silver vis-a-vis -vis other commodities. Through the lens of the gold to CRB ratio, he delineates a stark reality what ostensibly appears as a gold rally is, in essence, a broader commodity upswing. Silver, too, languishes in the shadows of a genuine rally, as evidenced by its lackluster performance relative to other commodities. 
Faber unveils the underlying dynamics driving mining stocks' tepid response, shedding light on the pivotal role of relative commodity performance in shaping market outcomes. In a brief interlude, Faber shines a spotlight on Fortuna Silver Mines, symbol FSM, offering a glimpse into its recent performance and prospects. Amidst a backdrop of newfound optimism, characterized by a breakthrough of the 200-week moving average, Fortuna's robust cash flow figures underscore its resilience amidst market volatility. Faber's endorsement of Fortuna as a long-term investment echoes his conviction in the enduring allure of silver as a tangible store of value. And we can see here on a quick chart that we've broken through the 200-week moving average up here. Uh, it was at 440. We're now at 453. It could be slightly different by the time you see this because the stock is very volatile out of the gold and silver markets right now. But we're at a new uh, two-year high here. Um, and it looks encouraging. We'll see where it goes. But I want to show you this. This is Fortuna's cash flow from its recently filed annual report for 2023 versus 2022. Uh, we have an increase in cash flow of about 53%, $297 million versus $194 million. We can see here that cash flow is doing really well, and I expect that to continue into 2024 as we have a full year of uh, accretions or accretive earnings from the new projects in Africa. And I personally do not trade this stock. I own it for the long term. And let us continue with this week's silver report. I want to go to the repo market for a second here. Uh, this chart, you see a black line and a blue line. Black line is the amount of volume in the repo market. We see here we hit an all-time high of $2.023 trillion on March 31st, 2024, in the quarter turn, which was expected. Uh, and here we have the security overnight financing rate, which is the repo rate, what banks charge each other to borrow and lend cash overnight. Here was the apocalypse over here. And we see, what, what do we see here? We see that the volume in the repo market does not go down until and unless the Fed cuts rates. And these are the, uh, basically the Fed rate, the repo rate is the overnight uh, rate, more or less. It's not exactly the same, but it's pretty similar. Uh, so we see here that the uh, the repo volume, right? It reached a, a fever pitch over here, which was a record in 2019, right before the apocalypse. Then the Fed started cutting rates after the apocalypse, and that only then did volume fall in the repo market, and it started rising again because they kept red steady here, and it hit a fever pitch over here, and then they cut rates again to zero, and this was the uh, the lockdown crisis, etc. And then the volume stayed pretty steady as. Uh, rates stayed at zero, but then they started raising rates and then the repo volume started to spike. But the problem is uh, the money supply is still shrinking. So this repo volume can't be sustained for much longer because dollars are running out and there aren't uh, as many dollars in the system now as there were back here. So we're going to hit a brick wall over here. And when we do, they're going to have to cut down to zero in order to get this volume down because the dollars don't exist to sustain it. And from there, I'm going to go to an article from Jared Blickery, the only guy I trust on Yahoo Finance. Why the Fed is wading into uncharted waters. Morning brief, a little bit of a correction on that. The Fed waded into uncharted waters in 2008. So they've been in uncharted waters for what, 16 years now, something like that. So Jared Blickery says down here, and this is what I wanted to highlight, Powell's big headache right now is an economy that re-accelerates, meaning uh, price inflation, that's what he's talking about, requiring further rate hikes. This is the so-called no landing scenario, right? Not hard landing, not soft landing. This is the no landing scenario. An economy that ran too hot and stayed there was the fate of Paul Volcker, who led the Fed in the late 1970s and early 1980s, which is when gold and silver made their moonshot. Volcker presided over a double dip recession as he tamped down inflation that at one point spiked to 15% annually. It would be supremely ironic, actually, it would be pretty likely if the same fate befell Powell, forcing another round of uncomfortable rate hikes, just as rate cuts are on the horizon. Navigating through the labyrinthine complexities of the repo market, Faber unveils a sobering reality, a relentless surge in repo market volume juxtaposed with shrinking money supply. The impending collision course between burgeoning demand and dwindling supply portends an imminent reckoning. Faber's astute analysis underscores the precarious tightrope the Federal Reserve treads as it grapples with the specter of runaway inflation and dwindling monetary ammunition. Citing insights from Jared Blicker's incisive analysis, Faber paints a portrait of the Federal Reserve wading into uncharted waters. 
against the backdrop of an economy hurtling towards runaway inflation. The specter of a no-landing scenario looms large, drawing parallels with a tumultuous tenure of Paul Volcker, Faber warns of the perils of aggressive rate hikes amidst a fragile economic ecosystem. The inexorable march towards zero rates emerges as the sole recourse amidst an impending financial maelstrom. Now, there's two things I wanted to emphasize here, is that first of all, rate hikes will make price inflation even worse because they will come at the expense of the Fed's earnings. And I've already showed you that when earnings get negative, real interest rates don't impact gold and silver prices and gold and silver keep going up anyway. Second thing I wanna mention is that Paul Volcker could theoretically and did get control of the situation because the debt was in principle payable back in 1979 and 1980. Now it is not. So there is no way that they can hike rates uh, hiking rates will bring gold and silver even higher. And so the only move the Fed has from here is to go back to zero when the next financial crisis hits, which in my opinion, though I could be wrong, will happen this year when the plumbing hits a wall. But there's two more charts I wanna show you before we close this week's Silver Report. One is Bill's Gone Wild. The new SIFMA report came out, which crunches all the numbers of the outstanding treasury. So we see here in the bottom left corner, uh, February 2024, bills outstanding. That's uh, one month to uh, one year maturity, short term treasury bills where the money markets are invested in. Outstanding has now broken the $6 trillion mark, $6.0112 trillion. So they're still raising money on the short end. They haven't converted much of it to notes yet. You can see that notes have not changed since January, they haven't changed much since 2023 a little bit but not that much we still have a lot to move over to the notes but the problem is if they make the notes auctions that really much bigger uh you could upset the bond market because dollars are running out and you might not have as not enough to sustain humongous auctions uh, and this is finally the chart that shocked me this is really for academic purposes take of it what you will this is the spot gold to CRB index ratio going back all the way to 1980. Uh, how gold, I couldn't find the one for silver, but I found the one for gold, how gold was performing relative to other commodities. The higher this line is, the better gold and silver are performing relative to other commodities. So at 1980, we were at this line at about, what is it, 3.0, let's just say. It, it almost hit this cross line at 3.03. So. Uh, where are we now? Uh, we're, we're at the same level. So silver, gold and silver relative to other commodities is at the same level as it was at the peak of the bull market in 1980. Doesn't that uh, freak you out? It's very surprising, but it is true. And it shows once again that gold and silver are money that they've been outperforming commodities, especially since 2008 when the real inflationary engine started over here. And they've been going up and up and up and up trending and we had a big spike over here from the lockdowns of course and this was the big retracement but we're on our way up again uh and we're going to go to new all-time highs and higher as the dollar dies and as gold and silver are revealed as money even to the layman